All right, welcome back to another episode of Raise Them Up, a podcast. Uh, I was going to say for parents, but I was the more I think about, it, the more I process this conversation we've been having, particularly with this book, is anybody who is willing to walk alongside of kids and students as they raise them up in the faith, you know, because it really is. That's one of the big takeaways that I'm taking away from this whole podcast. It's been great here on, I don't know if it's episode, I think it's episode 10 technically, because we had a couple of bonus episodes, but the reality of the church at large, the people of God surrounding our kids. And we have our same panel with us. Uh, We have Keith Kedeke, head of school. J.N. Martin, kids ministry director. Melanie Schultz, theology teacher slash stay-at-home mom. There you go. <laughs> and it's been really fun having the conversation with you guys. I've gotten a little bit of feedback already, and people are loving the different perspectives that we bring to the table right now. Did you say who you were? Oh, Pastor <laughs> Lee. Yeah, Pastor Lee's back. Yeah, I always forget that. I even forget that when I do church. Like when I'm up there, I'm like, oh yeah, I need to say who I am. Like, because there's people here that don't know me. So yeah, some people right. might, yeah. This may be their first one to listen to you. And they're like, who that's are you, true. crazy man? Yeah, jumping in on chapter eight. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, Pastor Lee Hope, uh, student ministry pastor here at Trinity Klein. The joy of working with seventh to 12th grade students primarily. Uh, and walking alongside. And I think I really do. I mean, Melanie's certainly working with high schoolers uh, for how long now? Six years. Six years, yeah. I mean, I just have a deep passion because I, I remember junior high and I remember yeah. high school. I think most of us try and block it out, <laughs> but how how difficult it really is to walk through adolescence. And again, I, I don't know if we've talked about the critical decade, maybe we have, but those ages of 15 to 25 and being able to have people that care about you in those times is so, so important. So I think that's where my passion comes from. I will always care no matter what my role is uh, for those walking through adolescence, especially those coming into the faith, whenever they come into the faith, whether that's high school or beyond that. And I think, man, Sticky Faith, I this is my first time fully through this mm-hmm. book. I've read it in pieces <laughs> before, but at chapter eight, I mean, I have to call it probably the most humbling chapter of the book as mm-hmm. it just kind of wraps up. And certainly so much of it is familiar to us. Um, but chapter eight is the ups and downs of the sticky faith journey. And if I had to kind of summarize it, uh, it was this idea of your your kid, every kid, every one of us, right, is unique. And that's including our faith and our faith journey to get there. To, so to start us off, I just want to start out with Devin's quote at the very start mm-hmm. of the chapter, because even reading that was humble, <laughs> humbling to me. And then then certainly, the, yeah, let's jump into the conversation. Uh, but one of the students that, that they did this research 10 years ago, and I've kind of shared, as we go through this, you'll hear from us that this could have been written yesterday. I mean, it's still that relevant mm-hmm. and, and relative to what we're, we're talking about. But here's Devin's word. He, he said, your faith is your faith. It is not your parents or your pastors or your friends. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. Not so you can justify it to other people, but so you can justify it to yourself. So you can live without internal contradictions, right? Even hearing that, like what comes to mind for you guys? And it's huge. So many of us, we, we push uh, internal contradictions to the side, um, you know, and you, I know this probably isn't the best thing, but uh, I guess I'll do it anyway. And I think we all deal with them. So for for this student, Devin, to recognize that and recognize that faith can and should speak into the way we're wired and the way we make decisions um, and that we have to be okay with it or we are walking contradictions, I think that's really mature. Um, And he's probably coming from a place of having walked through those himself. Exactly. (laughs) How do you get through that except on your own? Um, and I, that's a beautiful part about this chapter is it really does, it's God is working in and through that person's life, your child's life. And he is bringing them to maturity. He is, he, and it's, it's messy, but he is doing that faithful work so that they can recognize those potential contradictions that they're hearing, that they're walking, that they're living. Um, and then they got to, they got to see it face to face. They've got to look it in the eyes and, and decide what to do with the voices they're hearing out there, the voices they're hearing from the parents and the word of God. And where did where do they actually land? Exactly. I mean, no doubt about it. And as I think about that, I think about this quote, um, I'm reminded of, <laughs> talk about the full circle, Melanie, like uh, probably four years ago, like you and uh, your husband had, had been crew leaders for me, right? Yeah. And so we got to interact and there was a level of I, I don't have a great history with apologetics, right? Which yeah. was Melanie's specialty at, <laughs> at Concordia. Point, yeah. 
<laughs> and so uh, I remember talking in one of my talks, I kind of said something negative about apologetics. Now that's because I grew up in yeah. Georgia, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and if you don't know this, like that's full yeah. on full on Bible Belt, mm-hmm, right? So, mm-hmm. so no one knows what a Lutheran is, right? A Lutheran's a cult because we drink blood. I remember hearing that in childhood <laughs> oh, gosh. because of our understanding of the <laughs> sacrament, <laughs> right? And uh, so, so you have, I, I grew up with a ton of Baptist friends. And I, again, I love every single Christian, mm-hmm. um, but there's this very militant um, kind of perspective in my hometown, particularly. And so you found particularly my Baptist friends, again, God loves them, I love them, um, but they would, if you weren't them, come at you, you know? Mm. They, they would come at you for things. And I remember standing in a restaurant with a friend of mine from high school mm-hmm. or from a different high school, but we knew each other kind of growing up. And he was asking me a whole lot about apologetics. Well, what about apologetics? Why aren't you talking about apologetics? Like, why yeah. is your, your church not doing that? Because for him, apologetics was this militant approach to prove someone wrong in a conversation. Right. And to me, I was like, yeah, uh-uh. that's, yeah, that's not, not going to go get. well. <laughs> exactly. So especially four years ago, yeah. I was sitting there and in apologetics, I have found, especially in ministry and living it out, are super helpful for us mm-hmm. as Christians because of what Devin's pointing out. is So you can justify it to yourself so you can live without internal contradictions. We need apologetics to be able to, to def- defend our own hope. Uh, to, mm-hmm. Because there's, there's, and this is what Sticky Faith has done so well for me. Again, yeah. I've been able to live this out just in ministry this year by walking through this book yeah. of welcoming doubts, welcoming questions, mm-hmm. because we all have them. Yep. Every single one of us. And it's okay. And that's where I love, again, scripture is so, so great at welcoming doubts too. I, I mean, yes, don't live in the doubts, don't stay in the doubts let those doubts do what they're doing to you. And they're going to bring you to God every single time. Mm -hmm. Let the world talk, let God talk back, you know? So that's kind of what's landed on me a lot, especially as we start this. I mean, Keith, Jan, what are you guys feeling as you, as we start this chapter together? Yeah. So Devin's quote, I liked as well, but I looked at it from a mom's perspective Okay, who has, you know, teenage daughters that their faith is not my faith. Mm-hmm. It's their faith. And this sticky faith journey is not my journey. It's their journey. And I, I'm kind of along for the ride, right, to help guide them. And, I mean, the book has made it clear that my faith is important exactly. for them to see mm-hmm. and to model, but that their faith is not my faith. And I need to allow them to walk their own journey. And what you just said there at the end was one of the big, like I have it on the biggest letters on my page, page 184, it said, how you live your faith will have a greater uh, uh, impact than any other factor. It's talking to parents. And again, it's no secret. We've known this, right? We've known this all along. And especially when we look at scripture, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about this with our next book, which we'll preview at the end. The That's how God designed it, mm-hmm. is for parents to be an intentional presence in the lives of their kids and to model and to teach mm-hmm. and to watch them grow and to walk alongside and to guide. And that was a huge thing that we've seen throughout the book, but certainly that really came home in this in this chapter about you living out your faith is the best thing you can possibly do. Mm-hmm. And y'all, I mean, Keith, being school, right? You know all about drop-off culture, right? Whether education, but also faith. And we've got to talk about it a little bit on the on the podcast. But I mean, when you hear all this about parents and faith, but also the kids owning their faith, what thoughts come to your head? Well, it's very, <clears throat> very profound here. I'm, I'm going to say something that most people don't know, but... Uh, People are going to do what they're going to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just the bottom line is kids are going to do what kids are going to do. And, you know, they can do it with, you know, parameters when they're in school. But, you know, when I taught third grade 100 years ago, it seemed like <laughs> I used to put, you know, you always write assignments on the board, math, page 37. And I would always put religion on the door and say your religion grade starts when you walk out the door. Because, you know, we could all sit there in third grade and Jesus is great and we all love each other and go to recess and get out of my way, I'm first. You know, and that's really where it comes to to test is is when you get out there. And yeah, everybody, we can, we try to protect, we try to hold, we try to make everything the perfect bubble. But the bottom line is your kid's going to get out there and, and they're going to live their own life. They're going to make their own decisions. And if you walk beside them, Instead of trying to push them or try to drag them, whichever whichever <laughs> end you're going to work from, 
Working beside them is probably <laughs> the one I would recommend. And because yeah. they're gonna you know what? They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Exactly. I mean, and that's what it's been refreshing to read through. And that the example of that NFL coach who had to have the high school coach speak into truth in his life about mm -hmm. his kid eating breakfast, you know? Oh, yeah. Like things like that. It was just refreshing to be reminded of. Your kids are going to do what they're going to do. They do hear you. They do hear you. They're just rebelling. That's a natural thing that happens in adolescence. And, and it's okay, you know? They're going to do what they're going to do, but they are also watching you. And you have to do what only you can do. So yeah, the Sticky Faith journey, like this book, right? If you're if you're trying to find a silver bullet equation, you're not going to find it. Mm -mm. Uh, not not for your kid, but hopefully you're learning something for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I liked what you said. I mean, like walking out the door of the classroom is the same thing for us. To some extent, now don't hear me wrong. I, I hope that you are coming to church <laughs> and I hope <laughs> yeah. that you're in this building, <laughs> but I care significantly more about what happens off of this campus than I do than what, or, or the hour of time that you spend with us, however mm -hmm. you do that, than, than I do about what you do when you're on campus. It's easy to be good at church, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to be good when you're together in that time. It's a lot harder to actually live your faith out. And I think that's what we're seeing our world needs, right? That's what our kids need is to be seeing faith actually lived out when you're driving down the road, which is probably the hardest one for me. <laughs> uh, uh, when you're interacting with your neighbors, when you're interacting with conflict, like when you have worries, when you have fears and things like that. Uh, Keith, you, you kind of talked about that presence and what kind of presence that's going to be. I know for me, page 183, they had a great kind of back and forth list of things of what are you going to do when your kid messes up or when your mm -hmm. kid fails or when your kid's doing something different than you expect them to do. And, and the biggest piece of advice that they have uh, for, for the parent is just to be there. And it talks about what does that look like when you're afraid, when you're afraid of the decision that they've made, you're afraid of what's happened. Are you going to react, control, force, and dictate? Mm. Which is all from a place of the words it uses, anger. Uh, an overreaction and an emotional battle and a desperate pleading, right? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the spirit that you walk in with for your child? Or is it going to be one where you respond, where you guide, where you shape, where you listen, which is all the spirit of being available and present? And I thought that was huge. I thought yeah. that was so significant. And again, I know we've talked about this, but for some reason reading this, and I don't know if it's just been a tough week or what, but like, it was so much more humbling reading mm -hmm. it this in this chapter than I saw in any of the previous chapters. Yeah, I think they were wise in putting this chapter last because at first I was like, oh, why didn't you just use this as the beginning chapter? You know, oh yeah, they're going to be ups and downs. It's going to be messy. Well, that's why, because I'd glaze over it. Yes. <laughs> but now that I've come to the end and I've got some of the tactics and some of the ideas and I've got some of the data, it's just so critical to recognize there will be the downs, there will be the messy, and you are not in control of your kid. You're not asked to be in control of them, their faith. That's not what God needs from you. <laughs> so what you are supposed to be is faithful to him and loving of your child. And I love that they, they, they use the word unbridled love somewhere yes, in the chapter. That, that's absolutely. what you offer, unbridled love. Um, God bless my mom because I remember going through a phase in middle school, I mean, oh, yeah, middle school, um, of learning about St. Paul telling women to be quiet in the church. <laughs> And I lost it as a kid. I was so, St. Paul is sexist. I don't know if I believe anything that he wrote. And I'm saying this in the donut line that my mom, and so like there's these ladies walking by and there's people walking around and I am mad. And my mom is just going, well, uh-huh. Oh yeah, that's tough. Uh-huh. And she, she didn't, she didn't try to talk me off the ledge. She didn't try to tell me off. She didn't, she wasn't using apologetics, the defensive, mm -hmm. you know, like she wasn't trying she reprimand, to, didn't she just correct. was like, yeah, it's tough, but I know God loves me and I know he gave me his word. And so her speaking to her faith in that moment allowed me to hang on, you know, and then having some wonderful classes in college and things, I got a lot of my questions answered. <laughs> I have a whole lot better relationship <laughs> with St. Paul now. Um, but it, yeah, it just, it, it, being there. She was there for me. Um, and she wasn't trying this desperate plea of, I'm so worried about you and what's going to happen if you don't believe, which I think is my tendency toward my kids is mm -hmm. to be very fearful that their actions are going to um, lead them down some 
you know, irretrievable path. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when they talked about listening and being there and like your mom's example, right? Mm -hmm. Just listening. Yeah. And offering a little bit of guidance, but I think you've got to be attuned to your kids, right? If you don't have a relationship with your kiddos, then you're not going to know when they're ready to hear yeah. What you have to say, because that's the other thing I've learned having middle school and high schoolers. They they don't always want to hear me. Yeah. And and they don't hear me. They have very selective hearing. <laughs> so I need to be attuned and paying attention for those moments when they are hearing. Yep. Right. And we can have those good conversations. But in those m- moments when they need to vent or they're sharing their thoughts or their feelings that terrify me, I've got to mm-hmm. listen mm-hmm. and put on that mask of, okay, I'm not terrified. Yeah. I've got to just be there yeah. in the moment. Because you know what? When they're sharing those things with me, they're sharing them with me. And one of the other things to remember is when they are sharing those things, that means there's a wrestle happening. Absolutely. Something, something exactly. is going God's on. God's on their mind. Mm-hmm. Like that's, God, that's yeah. the cool thing. God's on yes. their mind. God and, is in their speech. God is in their thoughts. Praise God for that. And yep. had I not been that worked up about it, I would not have been that passionate in college to look into it, to dig into it. And I would not be able to speak into the same kinds of questions that my high school females have. Um, you know, that they're wondering, well, how does, how does God feel about me? Because the world says that the Bible is sexist. Mm-hmm. Well, can I please just show you what God says about f- females, what God says about women, how God uses them in scripture, how God loves them. And, you know, I can do that because I had a wrestle that was sincere and rough and it lasted a long time. And I was able to, and allowed to work through it and not just told, you know, calm down or get over it. Yeah, because the gut reaction, especially when you're afraid, is to fix, mm-hmm. right? If I can just step in and fix, I need to protect. I need to do all this stuff. I need a lawn mow. I need yeah. to like get get everything out of the way yep. for my kid. And it's like that's that's not what your kid asked you for, you know. And yeah. sometimes they do, right? Sometimes they get used to it. They get used to you paving the way for everything. But but one day, baby bird's gonna leave the nest, mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. in- inevitably, right? Like there is the, you, God willing, will will not outlast your child, yeah. right? And so you're going to be gone at one point and they will have to fly the nest themselves. They're going to have to raise kids themselves, you know? So there's this layer of that kind of freedom being given. And that, that kind of freedom's tough. Tr- that kind of trust is tough. And like, uh, I, I loved how this chapter kind of laid out the stages that, that you guys face as parents. Because mm-hmm. it talked about elementary school. Yay. Right, <laughs> like bless, bless Jay Ann for being able to do kids ministry <laughs> because the kids are very excited about Jesus and go Jesus and let's learn this. And mm-hmm. obviously it's not always the case right. and there's different no, they, reasons yeah. in rebellion, but for the most part, they're sponges soaking everything Well, that's up. why God says have faith like a child, right? Because they come in and they totally are like, oh yeah, you say it, I believe it. Exactly. I have faith and I trust. And then those things start happening in their lives that they learn, oh wait, trust can be broken. And it talked about then when you transition from elementary school and get a little older, it goes to middle school and says the main question is, what are we doing? Right? So it's really (laughs) up to what's happening. Like, if this is cool, if it's fun, I'm going. If not, you know, and I'm kind of like, that might even be now. That's a little dated piece, probably late elementary school. It's Mm -hmm. not even middle school because their question for high school and college is 1,000% the question of junior high and above, Mm -hmm. which is who's going to be there? (laughs) Yep. Every yeah. single time I hear that of, so who is all going to be there? We've gotten to the point in student ministry this year, which is different than a year ago, different than two years ago, um, that we've had to do signups for every single event. So you can so tell them Just so they can see who's coming, right? I don't need money to show up on anything. Everything we do is free for the most part, right? On weekly programming stuff, but they just want to know who's going to be there. And then when they show up, right, when they didn't RSVP and they see no one was there that they wanted to be there, uh, they don't show up the next week when their friend shows up. Mm, and uh, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just an endless cycle of who's there. And that becomes a huge motivator. But at the end of the day, and this is, I had a really interesting conversation with a pastor buddy who also works with students recently of when it comes to your kids, what do you, what do you, what's your motivation? What are you concerned about? And, and this is going to sound fancy and I don't like it when things sound fa- fancy. So I'm going to break them down simply. Uh, his perspective was that the church a lot of times is very concerned about uh, people's, but especially our students when they're young and as they move through junior high, high school and college, their morality. Mm, okay. So mm-hmm. the church's concern is whether or not the kids are good, 
right? Yeah. Are they doing bad things or good things? And this is so crucial for elementary school kids. They, that communicates to them. They mm-hmm. totally get it. But once they hit the end of elementary school, they transition into middle school, that no longer works. And why does that no longer work? Because we're all bad. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of us is bad. We yeah. mess up. We make mistakes. Scripture says this very plainly. All have fallen short of the glory of God, mm-hmm. right? Uh-oh, because we know what the wages of sin is. That is death. And that word leads me to where, and he was like, oh, that's, <laughs> it was funny because he's much older and wiser than I am. Uh, and he was like, oh, that is a different way of thinking about it. <laughs> I said, I'm not so concerned about my kids' morality. I am much more concerned with their mortality, mm-hmm. Right. So their life and death reality, because that's the gospel. I mean, I'm sure I've said it on the podcast already because it's an endless refrain of mine. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not that he came into this world to take you from being a bad person to a good person. That's foreign concept, Mm -hmm. right? Your your good behavior will not get you into heaven. It is not you. It is him, Mm -hmm. his. And what is it that he came to do? The gospel is not bad to good. It's that Jesus came into this world to take you from death to life. Mm -hmm. And y'all, when I see this generation, this is where this this chapter just spoke to me and humbled me. These kids know death Mm. by the time they hit junior high and high school. They know the things that kill them, right? Spiritually speaking, right? They know things that destroy. They know things that that leave them feeling isolated, feeling this weight. Because the number one challenge we're seeing in, in kids these days is mental health, isolation, and loneliness. And here's this book written 10 years ago that says this. For today's kids, feelings of isolation, performance-driven agendas, and abandonment by those who are supposed to be there for them have taken a massive, massive toll. Growing up is difficult and lonely. And I was like, this could have been written yesterday Mm -hmm. because that's, that's what we're seeing. Right. And so that's why this chapter goes so full force into being present. It talked about in those same as this is all page 178. And it talked about then like what they're missing is adults who care for them and are willing to put themselves into their lives for reasons that are not Mm self-serving. Right. They're missing that. And that's really the call of sticky faith, the call of the church, from the beginning. It's, it's the call of God's people. I can't even say it's the call of the church because as you go all the way back to Deuteronomy 6, mm-hmm. it's doing this, right? God puts his people together to walk alongside of everybody so that we know that we're not alone because he knows what the devil is good at and that's isolating, isolating. us. Yep. I know I've gone on like a little mini sermon, but <laughs> like, <laughs> like when you hear all of this, I mean, how much does this resonate with you too? I mean, that that quote will stick with me forever about the things that our kids are facing with feelings of isolation, performance-based driven agendas and abandonment from those who are supposed to be there for them. Like, where have you seen that to be true too? I mean, I mean, am I am I speaking to the, the the choir or am I speaking foreign language? No, I think so. For adolescents, right? I remember when I was in middle school and high school, the world was all about me. And as soon as a friend would do something that you didn't want them to do or that you thought was against you, you were like, oh my goodness, the whole world Mm -hmm. is against me, right? Because my focus was here Mm -hmm. and on me, on me, on me. If we can work on shifting our kids' focus from looking just inwardly to looking outwardly at others and most importantly at God and remembering that He is always there and He is never going to leave you. He's never going to lie to you. He's never going to talk about you badly to somebody else. He's never going to, you know, not let you sit at His table at lunch or whatever it is. I I think that's so huge for our kids. It's not going to take away that moment of pain, right? But it's going to shift or hopefully (laughs) eventually start shifting what they do with that pain and what they do with those experiences, because we're all going to have those experiences. I think one of the things that I say all the time, especially having girls, is girls, a lot of these things you're going through right now, you're going to continue going through. They're, they're, I mean, because, and I don't mean this in a bad way, and in fact, Facebook flagged me one time as putting something offensive because I just said girls are mean. Mm. Because girls can be mean. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a, it's, it's one of those things where I I think for women, you're every, you're looking at what everybody's 
outward kind of thing is, right? And you want to make sure that everybody's looking at your outward in a good way. So you try to make them look at other people's outward in a bad way. And so those those conflicts and those relationship problems are never going to go away. But the cool thing is God's never going to go away either. So it's just reminding them of those things that, yeah, it doesn't get easier. And, right, the witness of the church is, and in those struggles that are never going to go away until Jesus comes back, he's surrounding you with people oh, yeah. who love you and care about you solely because he loves you. Yes. Right? And and that's every single one of our calls. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's identifying those people and being willing to accept that love and care from people that aren't necessarily your peer group. Mm-hmm. It's others outside of that peer group, which I think is really, really hard for our kids right now. I mean, it was hard for me, so. <laughs> so pulling some of these pieces together from the chapter um, and, and some of the things that you said, Lee, like the the fact that, that we're not called to, <laughs> going for good morality in our children <laughs> is not necessarily what we're about, nor is it well, what it God's work. about, it right? Work. It won't work. <laughs> it yeah. won't work. Um, and then a piece from the chapter talking about how we can either be driven by this like crippling, paralyzing fear that causes us to control. It makes me think of the like, what kind of voice is my child hearing from me? Are they actually hearing the devil's voice of accusation and fear oh, and wow. isolation? Or are they hearing the voice of God that God has taken care of it in Christ, that I am a new creation, that I am loved, that I am, you know, valuable, that I'm important, and that I that God is gonna see this good work through in me. Like he's he's going to bring that good work that he started to in me to completion. I think that's powerful enough. It needs to be said again, right? (laughs) (laughs) What voice is my child hearing from me? Are they hearing the voice of the devil, the accuser? You know, what what are you doing? Why can't you, you know, why can't Mm -hmm. you get it together? Oh, I can't believe you were so mean, so rude, so whatever. That leads to isolation. That leads leads to to isolation. Mm -hmm. Leads to detachment. And and leads me to to believe that I I don't have a place or or my my I'm not loved. Yeah, I'm not loved. And I can't do this. You're right. Well, you can't. Okay, fine. But- you, but but it's not you who does good works either. It's Christ in you. Mm-hmm. Your eyes got to be on there. So yeah, man, it's so humbling because I do. I am so often ruled by fear, which again, you're going to go back to the wisdom of Yoda. <laughs> fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate is the path to suffering, the dark side. Like, ugh, am I yes. am I <laughs> allowing fear? <laughs> you just to be made the voice. Pastor Lee's day. I'm sorry, this is great. <laughs> he loves it. That was truly that was my that was my motto in one of my classes when I first started teaching because I did not want to be so afraid that I ended up pushing my students away. I didn't want to be so afraid that I couldn't control or that I wouldn't get the outcomes that I was looking for that I ended up pushing my students away. And I have to remind myself of that with my kids too because I am a person that's ruled by fear and I need to not let a voice of accusation into my head about my parenting, nor do I want it to come out of my mouth at my children. Mm -hmm. I have to start letting God's word and God's truth and his promises speak to me as a parent and then through me to my children about their identity. Completely agree. And... I want to I want to circle back actually something Jan was saying. This is going to sound like a really weird segue, but it's something that's on my heart. And maybe it's because my grandmother was an English teacher, my sister's an English teacher, I was an English major. Uh, I really deeply appreciate uh, reading. <laughs> and I was recently talking to there's someone in my grow group who is works with our local uh, independent school district in the reading area. And uh, we were talking about the calendar switches, potentials of schools and Mm year-round school and all this stuff. And she was saying about how year-round school is really good for elementary school students to read, right? Because mm. any anytime they take time off of reading, you're like set back, set back, set back. And, sure. But for, I, I was kind of pushing back. I was like, well, here's the thing. My, my junior high, my high schoolers, they don't like to read. Like I, I really, mm-hmm. I talk about it often, how wonderful reading is, how great it is. And someone pointed out to me recently, I think it might've been a podcast, uh, that uh, reading actually helps you develop, Jan, what you were talking about. Being able to see others, mm, other empathy. people's stories, empathy, see a different picture, a different perspective. And I think to some extent it's true of TV shows and movies, right? So sure. I think I think stories help us to do that, but particularly reading. So the small little segues, please, please help your child be a reader and also model being a reader, you know, because I, I recognize my sister and I, we read so much, not necessarily because we had great teachers. We did uh, along the way for when it came to language arts. I remember every single one of my middle school and high school English teachers, um, but also because my mom read. 
right? And so that really did. I mean, and granted, I think being the lower middle child also helps <laughs> <Like> you <laughs> not be so selfish. You have to see other people's experiences and mistakes and learn from them. But truly being able to get outside, because when I see this generation, this Gen Z and, and the, the generation below them, that, that uh, isolation, which feels so great sometimes, being able to focus just on yourself is super destructive once they hit uh, seventh grade and upward, you know? So being able to get, get outside of that, Keith, I've talked too long and haven't heard your voice. I would love to know your thoughts. Well, I would say, <clears throat> you know, we always focus on what our kids do, and that's fine. I mean, we have to show them the right way. Train up a child, he will go, and he will depart from it. But there's a, also a shift on what is our kid going to do about it. I mean, they are going to fail. They are, they are going to be sinful. And going back to what Melanie said about, you know, do you accuse or do you ask them, well, what are you going to do about it? You hand, if you hand back, really what we, I think we want as parents is we want to see our kids problem solve. But do we give them the opportunity to problem solve? So do we hand back the problem to the child? And, you know, how, what are the, okay, you're going to do something? What, what's the ramifications of that? You know, I'll, I'll make a silly statement, you know, like, like your kid comes in and says, I'm going to jump off the roof. No, you're not. Okay. Well, if they have a cur curiosity to jump off the roof, <laughs> they're probably going to do it with or without your permission at some <laughs> time. <laughs> but if you have a conversation, well, okay, you're going to jump off the roof. What could happen? Okay, I, I know what you want me to say. I could get hurt. Right. And if you broke your leg, could you play soccer, basketball? Could you walk? <laughs> I mean, you know, all these things. And, and when they think it through, well, you know, maybe it's not the right thing, but it's their decision not to jump off the roof, you know. Um, and I think that's just the way the world goes. I mean, I think education is like that. You know, you, you know Jan talks about reading, which is great, but the true education is when a kid actually reads something that they don't have to. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, wow, look at, they're actually reading a book, mm -hmm. you know, on their own and they're not getting, you know, what, what's our, our is this going to be graded? You know, you don't <laughs> oh, get, exactly. you don't yeah. get asked about that. It's just, that's just who they are. You know, we shape their, try to shape their DNA, but their DNA is what their DNA is, but they shape their own DNA. And part of that is they're going to do what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. But that's, to me, is where it really, do we really let them solve their own problems? You're there to be the coach, the guider, the, the hey, this is, this is, what would that look like? What would that look like jumping off a roof? Hmm, okay, have you thought about, can I make a suggestion that maybe you try something a little shorter? <laughs> you know, because, you know, uh, and stuff like that, but. If the curiosity is there, which don't we teach our kids to be curious? Don't we teach our kids to expand and do new things? And then sometimes they do things we don't want them to expand to. Well, yeah, there's a there's a fine line between what we want them to do and what they mm -hmm. want to do, but we all want them to do something. Mm -hmm. Has any child ever been chastised for doing nothing? <laughs> probably. probably. Oh, yeah. yeah, probably. <laughs> well, you need to get out there and make friends, but I'm not going to teach you how to be friendly. <laughs> Oh, sure. Things like that. You know, it's, it's to be loved, you have to be somewhat lovable. And um, that's just something we, I think sometimes we just worry with the fear and, and, and what could happen. We don't really look at what could happen positively. There you go. But, um, and I think you're hitting on so many of the themes. I mean, the chapter started out with life is their best teacher. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, how are they going to learn they shouldn't jump off a roof? Well, it might be by jumping off a roof. <laughs> what, you know? what parent hasn't put a, a cup of hot soup, in, hot soup in front of their child and say, don't eat that, it's hot. And they, their kid's still going to have still burnt tongue. Exactly. Every child has probably burnt their tongue. <laughs> well, what does that mean? You give them, don't give them hot soup? Well, no. They're going to have to learn that soup is hot and there's a patience and a, and a way to go about doing it that is not harmful. But again, I think, Every child I ever know probably has said they have burnt their tongue on something, even though what? I you told, told you told not you. to yeah. do that. So Right. But I think that's a critical piece of, of the puzzle for parents is how to be a guide versus controlling, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily about saying things as a command or a don't do this or you better do that. It's more about stating information and letting your child make a decision with what to do with that information. Yeah. Like you can say, you can say, hey, soup's hot. 
But if you say, don't touch that, it becomes the magic button that they want to touch, right? You know, it, it just, it, and, that, and it does, it speaks to a level of control that we, by nature, as we grow in, in that, in childhood and adolescence, we want to push back on. We want to push back on that boundary. That's a good natural thing for us to do. So are you speaking and communicating with your child in a way that is a command um, or are you giving information and helping to guide your child by giving information and asking questions and allowing them to make their own choices? Um, if your child is reaching for the piping hot burner, are you going to grab their hand? Yes. Okay, fine. But in general, right, yeah. what? how else can you give them choice? How else can you provide information, be a listener, ask questions, and then watch them do what they're going to do um, to be there to maybe help pick up the pieces because maybe they are going to make a bad choice. Or to say, hey, that was great. You really thought that through. I saw you working on that really well. That's awesome. Right? It's to reinforce those positive skills that your kids need to really function on their own. Yeah, and there there are situations. We're not we're not saying there's not situations where you don't need to step in. Absolutely, especially sure. physical safety. Like oh, we yeah. totally understand that. But I like this idea of life teaching you, and and also recognizing your kids are going to do what they're going to do. Yep. Right. So especially a natural part of adolescence is craving new experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, and and abs absolute curiosity. And when in their curiosity, they're going to find things you would hope they never <laughs> found mm -hmm. in the same way that your parents hoped you would have never found them, right? Yep. And they're going to do that. But I love that. Have, have and this circles back to previous chapters. Mm -hmm. Have the conversation. Yep. Oh, you're going to party. What do you think's going to happen at the party? Oh, there could be alcohol right? Or, or maybe they're not saying it, right? Because they're kind of hiding like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Again, <laughs> Go figure. very original thing, right? Uh, and, and saying, well, what do, you, do you think there could be alcohol there? And if, they're go, if they go, no, like the, the answer is probably. Guess what? If they're going yeah. to a party and they're in high school, yes. Well, and I'll say, <laughs> I have to say from my own experience, not because I ever got invited to the party, but in <laughs> middle school too, right? Oh yeah, I guess there's, so. There's a layer of, yes. hey, there, I, I, okay, even though you think there couldn't be, I think, oh, yeah. there, I think there probably could. And your kid's going to be like, they're letting me go to this party and they think there could be alcohol. Like mm -hmm, what is happening, mm -hmm. right? You're going to blow their mind with the trust that you're handing to them in that second. And for you to be able to say like, okay, so what, what, what do you feel like your response will be when someone asks you if you'd like a drink or dares you to drink or something mm -hmm. like that? Like, do you have a game plan? That's my question for you, you know, and, and just recognize that your brain, right? Especially if they're in middle school, your brain is just starting to develop <laughs> and things that you start picking up at this age will be habits that you'll have for your entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. And while I don't recommend it as a family viewing experience, uh, Tiger King will tell you how <laughs> life ends up, right? You know, when you don't read and you choose to do things and you make terrible decisions when you're in middle school and high school. So this could be your future if you uh, don't listen to your mom. At some point, I'd say by high school, yeah, that is a learning experience to watch. I mean, Mine I love that season it. two came out and it's just a reminder, <laughs> these are real people. I mean, oh, and, and it is, it's the backside of society, but like, that's the thing is, again, life's a teacher and seeing other people make terrible decisions <laughs> sometimes is a teacher for you too. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? All right, I won't spend forever on that one yet. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I, I'll <laughs> add to that too is like, you know, being old here. I mean, the world has changed so much for me. And like I talk about jumping off a roof. Well, we did that when we were kids. But you know what? We all had We all had one-story houses. Yeah, you know, I, I think about it now, and these oh, kids all true, have two-story houses. It seems like everybody's in a two-story house. Well, that ups the stakes pretty darn high, <laughs> and I I think that's just life. I think the stakes are a lot higher now. There's just a lot more accessibility to things that can do harm. I mean, social media, internet. I mean, we can go through all of them, but there's just so many things else out there. You know, just driving, be, be, being a client resident all my life. I mean, when I was driving. You know, I waved everybody I passed on the road because uh -huh. there wasn't that many. Now, you know, you don't even think about waving because there's just, you know, people Somebody think might you're get mad. Well, <laughs> well, your arm would get tired too because you know you pass more cars from <laughs> yep. you know half a mile down the road than I used to do all day. So, I mean, things have changed too, and I think it's hard for parents sometimes to understand what the their child's going through because they didn't go through that. They didn't have that same pressure. You know, you know we, we, I actually learned in school how to make a phone call and talk to someone politely on the phone. Hmm. But I don't think that happens anymore. No, I, no. I, I have kids, they just hang up. They don't say, well, okay, goodbye or, mm -hmm. or see you later or all that. They just click and 
and texting is a, and <laughs> texting as opposed to actually having a conversation with someone has changed and and that's what I'm saying is the way that they communicate and converse is gr very different which how many of these children have ever written a letter right. or a hand <laughs> or you know, addressed a, 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 a thank you yeah. or something like that and it's like well yeah I can just email well, or handwritten anything, right? <laughs> yeah. and, but you know, back in the day, we, you know, we we do a lot of cards here at Trinity. We, you know, the the older people. I mean, it's, it's it's such a treat to read those cards back to the kids, and they're like, "Wow, somebody actually wrote a card to us!" Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're they're not used to that. It, you know, they probably got grandparents that still do it, maybe. But it's just you know, I've never gotten an email from a from one of the shut ins thanking <laughs> me for cards. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a lot of cards in the mail, but I've, you know, I've never so once got funny. a text or an email from one. But it goes back to just how the world the world is different, and and the world was has always been complex. We have always been complex. We're miracles, mm -hmm. right? The human being is a miracle, and every single this is one of the things the chapter brought out. Every one thing affects the other. Mm -hmm. Every voice that you hear, every experience that you have every conversation and all these different things. What were all the different things it talked about? Uh, the, your identity, what you're told about that, your perspective, your posture, everything adjusts with one. It's like a spider web. If you touch one, it, it shatters, or not shatters, shakes the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? And so that's important how, how stressful that is, but how fun is it when you have a safe place to be able to, mm -hmm. to talk about it, to process it? You have different people in your lives and that, that sticky web, of, of relationships uh, that are present there. And I, I think that's where I go back to that the best thing you can do is live, live your faith out, parents. Live your faith out, Christians. Being, being an example, another quote that kind of stood out for me from that on 184 was, the, reali the reality is that what matters more than looking like we are living a faithful Christian life is choosing to live uh, a certain way because Christ has compelled us. Right? Is, is, is Jesus and what he has done for you significant? I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's yeah. an end all. Before you go anywhere else, it's not what, can I, what program at church can we do? What class can we go to? When can we go to worship every single week? It's y'all, is Jesus changing your life or not? If he's not changing your life, start. it's, it's the whole uh, oxygen mask, mm -hmm. right? You have to have your oxygen mask on before you can help someone else put it on. Right. And, 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 and I am saying this from a professional church worker perspective that focuses on adolescence. I will not have the impact on your child's life that you will. I will not have the impact on your child's faith that you will. Like it's not possible. I don't have enough time with your child in mm -hmm. a given year or a given week to have that kind of an impact that you can have. So put that mask on for yourself and get ready for a marathon of a lifetime of following Jesus and a marathon walking with your kid. And speaking of Jesus, I mean, we can go to where the chapter ends with the book, the book ends. And I thought it was just so brilliant. Mm -hmm. The illustration of what it truly means, something we've already heard from the beginning of what it means to trust Jesus with your kid. The book ends with this illustration. I mean, does someone someone else want to help us sure. with it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So it's this parents that are going to another set of parents for some assistance of like, okay, how do we raise our kids right? Similar to what we're doing here with this podcast. And um, the the older set of parents gave this picture. They said, we, we choose to picture uh, this moment handing over our daughter to Jesus, physically carrying her in our arms and placing her in Jesus' arms at the top of a mountain and Jesus is holding her and it's beautiful. And he said, you have to let her stay there <laughs> because yeah. there is, there is this desire to say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for taking care of this one problem for my daughter. And now I'll take her back or, um, okay, thank you, Jesus, for holding us for this moment. But now I'm going to take my worries back and I'm going to continue to fret and stew. And, and they said, no, you can't. Once you put Jesus at the top of this mountain and you hand him your child, Leave her there. You have to keep letting Jesus have your kid. You cannot continue to try and control and pull back and and wrestle this. Um, it's just, it's it's not your job. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's not your job. Um, and I love what they said, that God loves your child more than you ever could. Mm -hmm. And he is able to control more than you ever could. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, praise God. I, I would praise imagine God for that. from yeah. a parent perspective, 
that Jesus is willing to hold my child mm -hmm. right over me. Because I, I know for me, I mess up things in oh, yeah. relationships. <laughs> I mess up things in my own life. Oh, yeah. And so thank God that Jesus is willing to hold my child. And I loved the conversation that happened at the end of this book of this couple, right, that was mm -hmm. given this illustration. Uh, the man says to the, the to, it was to, uh, to Chap, to, yeah, the, I think to so, the author yeah. of the book. He said, uh, here's the thing. We had a situation with my daughter where, where mm -hmm. we, we did that. We intentionally left her. I couldn't. And that's what the man says. Yeah. He says, my wife could. I couldn't. I ran back up the mountain and took him from Jesus or took her from Jesus. Yeah. You know, and I had to learn what it meant to go back and to do that. And I thought that was just so profound because where they kind of wrap up the whole point of the Sticky Faith book is this phrase, leave your child with Jesus. And, it, and it's a trust statement. Do you truly trust Jesus with your own life to handle? We talked early on about what's in your hand and what's in his. Do you really trust Jesus with your kid? Or are you trying to control it in yours? Right? And, and it's a huge, I mean, that's a faith. I mean, that's, that goes back to the word faith. Faith is about trust. Uh, ultimately, trusting, seeking, and following Jesus with everything that you have. Do you trust him with your own life? Do you trust him with your kid's life? And that's kind of where, where the chapter lands. And I think that's a beautiful place. Are you willing to leave your child in the arms of Jesus at the end of the day? Or at the beginning of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Several times a day. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, grace is sufficient. And that's just what it is. It's, you know, all, we, we spend our whole lives accumulating stuff and doing mm -hmm. stuff. But at the end, grace is all you have. Mm -hmm. Grace is sufficient. So for you parents, when, when you hear that statement, leave your child with Jesus, let's, as we kind of wrap up this conversation, what does that look like? for you as a parent. What do you think that means when you think about situations and challenges that you have faced or that you know you will face? What does it mean? Like when you think about this whole conversation we have with this entire book, what does it look like for, for you to do that so that our parents can kind of hear what it looks like for them too? Just recently I had a conversation with one of my kids about being frustrated with their sibling. Hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, not not a rare conversation, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and they said, I just wish they weren't even in our house. And, you know, it broke my heart on some levels. And I, I had this desire to rush in and fix it. Oh, no, you love your sibling. And they're they're great. And, you know, and, and Jesus tells us we better love. Like I, I, all of those things started rushing through my head to try and fix and control. But instead, I just sat down and I said, yeah, it's really tough to love sometimes. It's really tough, isn't it? It's really tough when they are doing things that frustrate you and had this conversation. And um, and I said, and I am so glad that Jesus loves me when I'm unlovable too. I said, I know I am frustrating. I know I mess things up. I know I am hard to be with. I'm, And I know that Jesus still loves me. And so I'm going to ask him for help when I'm having difficulty loving someone else. And so it wasn't like, and you need to do this and you need to do that, right? It was a very, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna talk to her about me and mm -hmm. what I struggle with. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to acknowledge where she's at. An keep, appropriate level. An appropriate right? level. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to accuse. I'm not going to silence, try to fix, shove something down her throat that's going to be, you know, you need to think this way, you need to speak this way. I'm just going to say, yeah, it is tough. And Jesus loves us, mm -hmm. and we're going to keep trying. And it goes back to that: which voice are they yeah, hearing? Which, yeah, exactly. From your mouth. Um, so that for for me, that sticky faith is is not allowing fear to try to cause me to hammer in what I want my kids to behave like and speak like. It that's not what it is. Because it won't work. It won't work. It will not do work. What they're I have tried do. that. Yeah. They're going to do what they're going to do. I have tried that, and it does not work. Yeah. <laughs> but for me to acknowledge where they are at in their individual day, <laughs> in their <laughs> life, in their season, whatever's going on. And for me to speak about what Jesus is doing in my life and what I trust he's going to be doing in their life. Love it. Love it. Jan, Keith, what does it look like to trust Jesus, to place your kid in the arms of Jesus? Yeah, I think for me, it starts with me remembering that I've got to trust Jesus with my mm -hmm. life. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And starting there and just making sure that every day I'm reminding myself that he loves me, that he's taking care of me because I can't give my kids to him until I, yeah. you know, make sure that I'm in the right place, mm -hmm. that my relationship is where it needs to be. I mean, again, like, you know, we've been talking about our kids are watching us, right? 
and, and more than just watching us, I mean, I can't do or I can't, you know, allow things to happen unless I'm doing them. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, it starts with me. And let's it starts with my faith. Use a moment to unpack that, right? So when a friendship isn't going well, trust Jesus. Model what it means yeah. to trust Jesus. Maybe that's a that, maybe that's a relationship with your spouse. Maybe you're fighting right now, and you got to trust Jesus with that. What does that look like? What how does that play out? Maybe a financial situation just hit your way or a loss of a job. Mm-hmm. What does it look like for you to trust Jesus with that? Or you get a health diagnosis for yourself or a family member that you love, or you lose. Maybe you lose a family member or a friend. Like, what does it mean for you to trust God with your friend, with the health diagnosis, with your response to this, right? Mm -hmm. What does all of that look like? How does that play out in your life? What does it look like to trust God with a person? Again, I'm speaking to myself. You guys, I wonder what you imagine is happening when I'm driving, but to trust God with the person that cuts you off, (laughs) right? Or something like that, you know, to trust God with the person that did something in the grocery mm. store that made you angry or upset you or they got in the 15 item line in front of you and they oh, got a right. basket full of groceries. There you go. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it look like? Again, and I think it connects back, Melanie, to what you were saying, for them to see Jesus in you, mm-hmm. right? To, to hear his voice as you respond to all these different situations. That's mm-hmm. what trusting Jesus with your life can look like. Keith, how about you? What does it look like for you to hand your kid into the arms of Jesus and let him let them stay there. Well, you know, it, I think if you just look at, we're all surrounded by immortals. You know, if we believe in eternal life, and our child is one of those, yeah. and you know, we did not create that child. We we think we did with what <laughs> you know with the physicality of it, but the stork, yeah, yeah. But God, yeah. God did all that, and oh. and <laughs> and. And what he's got planned is, is you know, he hasn't made it necessarily clear to us what he has planned for our child. He does promise that he has plans for them, plans to prosper them. And again, it's just trust, you know, each and every day. You know, we get so fearful about certain things, but, you know, every day we get in a car and every day someone perishes in a car mm-hmm. and we don't even think about it most of the time. Well, because we've gotten used to it and... And if faith is used every day, we have faith that we're going to get where we need to go. But I don't know how much time we have, but every day is a gift. That's exactly. why every day we say, this is a day the Lord hath made. Let us and rejoice and be glad, glad in, in it. it. Yeah. yeah, and and do we. Yeah. So rejoice. You got another it. day. Today's another it. day. And another day to hear from God's word, to hear his promises for you. Uh, and those same promises are true for your kids. To, 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 to talk to him. I mean, I really do think at the end of the day, the basics that we hear all the time, and I, and I get so many people want help with this, and I'm like thrilled. Like, let's talk mm-hmm. about how to engage with God's word. Let's, let's talk about prayer and what that looks like to be in constant conversation with God as he invites us to do. Mm. And to in those moments, tell God what you need for your kid. Trust you, place them in Jesus's arms in that moment through what you're saying and get angry. You know, if you're angry, get sad if you're sad, Mm -hmm. you know, rejoice if you're rejoicing, you know, constantly kind of turning back to these basics can be just so significant for each and every one of us with our own lives, but especially as we model the sticky faith that we have for our kiddos. And I hope you guys remember your own journeys along the way, right? I think it's (laughs) so funny. I think I've titled on my mom, maybe I haven't, but like there's at least one moment where like I learned about my mother's high school and college years. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> then why did you get mad about all this? Why'd you get mm-hmm. upset and all these other things? And she she said to me, well, I didn't want you to end up like me. <laughs> and, and I think that's the temptation of parents. Like oh, the, yeah. the temptation to helicopter, the temptation to mow the lawn in front of your kids so nothing can be in their way is because you don't want them to endure the same kind of pain and hurt and bad decisions. Mm-hmm. Well, spoiler alert, they're going to. <laughs> Actually, they're gonna, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different their ones. Own. It's going to be their own unique journey. And that is a gift to them to be able to, to have presence, people walking alongside of them, people caring about them. And, and you can be that for other kids too. Like mm-hmm. it's not just about your kids. It's about the kids in your kid's life or the kids as you get older, right? Since you said you taught 100 years ago, Keith, talking about you, right? You can still be present in, oh, in yeah. kids' lives and, and be someone that just cares about them and loves them, not because they're, you're trying to gain something from a relationship with them, but just because you know that they need it. And I think that's the beautiful picture that sticky faith 
has given us. Absolutely. So recommend it. One out, one out of 10. How, how much do you recommend the book uh, Sticky Face? 10 being absolutely there can be no better book. And one being don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to tell people what to do. Even <laughs> I, I know that sounds funny, but you know, if you have a desire to learn more and uh, explore, yeah, ten. If yeah. if this isn't something that pertains to you, keep it in your uh, toolbox for when you do need it. But but if you are raising kids and want to strengthen that relationship, go for it. It's a good book. Yeah. Jane, Melanie, what you feeling? Yeah, honestly, I wish I had read this when my kids were younger, mm. oh, right? Nice. Because yeah. there's a lot. I always tell some of my friends, I'm, I was a great younger kid mom, but man, these older ages, <laughs> I really suck at it. I guess it's okay <laughs> to say suck on our podcast. But there are times I'm like, man, I suck at this. <laughs> you want to trade? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes. But honestly, that's that's the, yeah. again, one of the things that I think there are some 10 out of 10 moments in this book. Absolutely. Yeah. The web of sticky relationships yes. is, is a 10 out of 10 moment for me. That That, that, that is something that I the hope conversations. Like, I will need to come back to this book again yeah. and again. Uh, maybe not every chapter, but yeah, there are exactly. some chapters in here that I need to remind myself of and, you know, the being intentional and, and building that web around my kids and those conversations and what those look like versus what my fear would inform me to make those conversations mm -hmm. like just some of those reminders. So yeah, I, I, I think there are some real gems in this, um, in this book. So it's going to stay on my shelf. That's for sure. Exactly. That's kind of where I'm landing too, is like, it's up there, right? Mm -hmm. Eight, nine, 10 somewhere. And I love what you said that there's 10 moments for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, but I love what you also said, you want to trade because that's the beauty of the church. Yes. Yeah. You don't have to. It's fantastic. Right? You I can know. live life together. Yes, that's right. Right. And that's the beauty of being able to have Jan walk alongside of your kids yep. and you walk alongside of her daughters, you know? Yep. And she and, did. My daughter was in her religion <laughs> class. Exactly, <laughs> right? So that's that's the cool picture that we have is none of us are alone in this journey and that's the beauty of what God has designed for it. And yep. I, and so I'm really excited. I'm I'm, I'm I, please give us your questions. We we're, we're planning to do a Q&A uh, with all the sticky faith episodes. So certainly once this one closes out, we'll wrap up that list of questions that you're you're looking at. You can email us at raise them up at trinitycline.org. That's R A I S E E M up up <laughs> at trinitycline.org. And you can also find us on the Facebook page, Raise Them Up Podcast. Uh, don't just do Raise Them Up on Facebook because you'll find something else. Um, but I'm excited <laughs> because we also get to turn the 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 page, <laughs> literally, Yeah. Uh, as we get our next book. And it, this is a 10 out of 10 book for me, for sure. I, will, <laughs> I probably will never give it a lower score than 10. Uh, the Spiritually Vibrant Home is our next book. Uh, it talks about... Uh, uh, loud tables, messy prayers, and open doors. And this really, it, it's actually a really good segue, a really mm -hmm. good transition for us because this, what we just talked about, that community and that you're not alone and the whole, from the beginning, this is how God designed things to be. This book helps us do that mm -hmm. and talk about what does it look like for your home to be spiritually vibrant. And, and here's the really great news. It's a Easy read, a very simple read, very natural. is written by a pastor who is looking at research from uh, Lutheran Iron Ministries in Barna called Households of Faith. Uh, and it was a pastor that loved the research and walked through an experience with his congregation. And this book is a result of everything that they saw and the advice. It's super practical. Uh, and and here's the other thing. You hear something like that, spiritually vibrant, and you think, great, he's trying to make us have homes like pastors, families do. <laughs> and what they learned in the research and in their own experiences is actually, no, it's not about being like super devout or anything like mm -hmm. that. It really is a lot of the things you just naturally do together as a family enrich the spiritual vibrancy of your home. So I'm really excited for that one. Yay. And so we're excited for our next episode, but man, we get to close the book of Sticky Faith, um, certainly holding on to a lot of what we've heard here because of how valuable it is. But we look forward to you guys joining us next time as we get to engage with the spiritually vibrant home. Mm -hmm.